Welcome back everyone, it's Charlie. This is going to be my Mandalorian Episode 7 video. So much stuff happened, there was a bunch of easter eggs, so we'll break it all down. There's also a change to the schedule again with next week's episode. Episode 8 will be the finale, so be sure to subscribe to get everything. I'll also start talking about what's going on with Season 2 when we get to next week. They finally have Baby Yoda merch to sell, so we're doing a giveaway. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and leave your best finale theory on the video. So careful for spoilers, if you haven't seen the episode yet, we'll do top 10 WTF and Easter eggs as we go along. Starting with number 10, the title of the episode, The Reckoning. So it's mostly a reference to The Reckoning for The Mandalorian because Moff Gideon is finally here, Giancarlo Esposito's character, and things are looking very, very bad for The Mandalorian and his crew and Baby Yoda by the end of the episode. Since the events of Episode 3, when the Mandalorian took off with the help of the other Mandalorians, things have gotten way worse on Navarro. We get more backstory on that planet's history, too, and its role in the galactic civil war between the Empire and the Rebellion. But Grief Karga sends a message to the Mandalorian offering him a new bounty, an opportunity to earn some money and clear the air between them, just some easy cash to help get rid of the Imperials. Obviously, it's way more complicated than he lets on. So number 9, welcome back Cara Dune. Because the Mandalorian doesn't trust Grief Karga anymore, he goes to get some backup. She's back on Sorgan where he left her, the planet from episode 4 with a village of krill farmers that they helped when they did their 7 samurai inspired story. She's been keeping herself busy, brawling with the locals, mostly for fun because the Zabrak that she winds up defeating later sort of passes by, gives her her credits for her win. She says thanks, come again, like it's a regular thing for her, beating up people in the tavern. Her big reason for not wanting to jump back into the fight is there's still a bounty out on her head from the New Republic because technically she's a deserter, but she's a former rebel shock trooper, so she has crazy good skills that he needs in this situation. The thing that turns her around on it is when he says they're going up against ex-imperials who she hates just as much as the Mandalorian hates droids. It just implied that she lost a lot of her friends during the Civil War to the Empire, so this is just another opportunity for her to stick it to them. And most of you probably saw earlier, they kind of explained why the Mandalorian hates droids so much. It's because the Separatist droid army rolled into his town where he grew up as a kid, killing his parents and the rest of the village. Most of you will recognize that the Zabrak is the same race as Darth Maul, although his tattoos are nearly as crazy as Darth Maul's, and obviously his skin is a different shade. But that's just a normal Zabrak. He's not Sith or anything like that. And the tattoos that they wear aren't just Sith tattoos. They're part of their culture, so most Zabrak, if not all of them, have tattoos like that. But the tattoos themselves are all unique to each different person. Speaking of tattoos, they also reference Cara Dune's rebel tattoos, identifying her as a rebel shock trooper later in the episode. You might want to cover that up. We're heading into Imperial territory, so it's going to get pretty dicey. One of the funnier things, too, earlier in the episode, when it's just the two of them, is that you notice Baby Yoda poking his head around while they're talking. It reminded me of that scene during Empire Strikes Back when Luke Skywalker first lands on Dagobah. There's also another Dagobah reference later in the episode that I'll explain in a second. But it's the funny scene where Luke Skywalker spins around and Yoda's there and he says, it feels like we're being watched. So there's several times in the episode where Baby Yoda makes it seem like he knows way more than he's letting on. Remember, he's 50 years old, so a lot of people are kind of confused as to how intelligent he is because you would think something that's 50 years old knows way more than an actual baby. Because of the way his race ages, it's kind of open to interpretation. He's basically a child by the standards of Yoda's race, but because he's been around for 50 years, he probably knows more than a typical baby would. Something that's really relevant to that too is when he grabs the flight stick controls and starts messing around with the ship. It almost like he senses that something really bad is happening, they're heading into a dangerous situation, and he's actually trying to take them somewhere else. Like, no, don't go. I've got a really bad feeling about what's going to happen. We need to go somewhere else. The way Mando and Cara Dune play it, he's just a mischievous child. Somebody needs to watch him or he's going to get himself into trouble. But I think the kid was actually trying to take them somewhere else, knowing that they're heading into a really bad situation. So number eight, welcome back, Ugnat Kuil. They go back to recruit him for help in taking care of Baby Yoda during the trip. The Mandalorian mentions he thinks that Baby Yoda is a strand cast. Now that's not something that's been mentioned in Star Wars canon before, but they're basically referring to something created in an artificial gene pool, as in something that you cast, create, with strands of DNA. I think this is also a reference to the plans that Moff Gideon has for the kid, using his DNA with Dr. Pershing in the cloning facility at Kamino's help to create a super army of clones that are force sensitive and easily controllable. 
Kuil mentions the Saito Caves of Nora. Those are also just a new location they created for the purposes of this episode, where they also do genetic engineering. So there were several references to genetic engineering in the episode talking about Baby Yoda. So I think that's just giving you an idea for what's really going on with Moff Gideon's plan. We also get Kuil's full backstory. He says he was sold into indentured servitude in the Empire during the course of the original trilogy and paid off his clan's debt to the Empire, earning his freedom, after which he came here. He hated working for the Empire, but he was forced to serve and he did it to help his people. But big WTF, we also learned that he found and reprogrammed IG-11. Taika Waititi comes back as that character, even though it feels like the biggest twist from his character is to come during the finale. But he's basically a helper droid now. He's not a hunter anymore, as he explains, but he does have really good defense capabilities. They have a big long montage with a couple funny moments of him having to reteach him everything. So he became this complete blank slate and IG-11 becomes a metaphor for Baby Yoda. So number seven, the parenting lessons in Baby Yoda foreshadowing. When Kuil is giving his big speech about rearing IG-11 back, talking about how droids aren't good or evil, they're just measures of the imprints that people put on them. So they're whatever you make them, which I think is a metaphor for the Mandalorian and Baby Yoda. Baby Yoda could swing evil or good depending on who raises him in those values. Like we could actually genuinely wind up with a Sith version of Baby Yoda should the Empire and Moff Gideon get their way. And then to reinforce that idea, number six, something, 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 dark side, Baby Yoda. He totally force chokes Cara Dune when she and the Mandalorian are arm wrestling, thinking that she's attacking him. Mando rushes to tell him, no, 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 she's a friend, please stop. And it seems like Baby Yoda doesn't totally understand what he was doing was wrong. He's like, oh, I thought you were in danger. I was just trying to help you. Kuil kind of lets on that he knows what's going on with Baby Yoda, even if he doesn't totally understand the Force. He's one of the few people that's actually talked about Jedi or Force abilities in any kind of way, but they don't directly reference the Jedi or the Sith. But then number five, back to Navarro in the Bogwings attack. So they meet with Greek Karga and his bounty hunters. One of these is actually a weak way, just like Hondo from the Clone Wars too, that you probably recognize. When Greek Karga talks about Baby Yoda, he makes a reference to a little Bogwing. The Bogwings are those giant raptor-like creatures with wings that attack them around the campfire just a little while after this. They're native to Naboo and Degoba, another reference. So calling him a little boggling, Degoba, member of Yoda species, just a nice reference to Yoda himself from the classic trilogy. But just to be clear, even though he's calling him a little bogwing and that is a Yoda reference, Baby Yoda isn't actually a version of original Yoda. He's just a member of Yoda's species. So that's why we call him Baby Yoda. We're not calling him the literal Yoda. He's just a member of his race. Grief Karga does the one thing that you never do in a situation like this. He says, everything's going to be fine. We'll totally be cool right before the Bogwings attack. They carry off two of the Blurgs, so press F in the chat to pay your respects for them. But then huge twist, Baby Yoda force heals Grief Karga, paying off that moment from episode two when he almost healed Mando before he stopped him. He's using the force to not only get rid of the poison, but close the wounds. If you're not familiar with this particular force ability, it's actually something from the Legends expanded canon. So it's not something that we've seen in the movies or the TV shows before. It doesn't seem like it drains him quite as much as it drained him when he was lifting the mud horn because later in the episode you see him with his eyes open when they're running back to the Razor Crest. So he's not completely passed out for the rest of the episode. But number four, the new Imperials. So Grief Karga double crosses the bounty hunters. They go back to town and we see scout troopers for the first time on this series on their speeder bikes. Nice callback to Return of the Jedi. The one that offers to buy Mandalorian's helmet for 20 credits is actually played by Adam Pally, who you might remember as this guy from Iron Man 3 or from Happy Endings. He's done a bunch of character work on TV, so you've probably seen him somewhere. Almost everything that comes out of Werner Herzog's mouth in this episode, every sentence he utters, is worthy of its own meme. He also gives us way more backstory on what happened to the Mandalorians during the Great Purge that they keep referring to during the series. Why did your people resist the Empire's expansion? Their home planet of Mandalore has been occupied by different governments throughout history a couple different times, but recently it sounds like what happened during the original trilogy is that the Empire officially wanted to take over and bring them into the Empire. They didn't want to have anything to do with that, and that's what led the Emperor to call his own version of Order 66 on the Mandalorians. We get a little teaser for Moff Gideon Giancarlo Esposito's character when he takes the call. Please don't think me rude, I gotta take this Skype call with my boss. So it kind of makes it seem like he's been working for Moff Gideon this whole time. 
They give you an idea for how much sharper he is than Werner Herzog's character too, because he instantly senses that they're being double crossed by the Mandalorian and Grief Karga. Oh really, he brought the child? You might want to double check on that. And he kind of chuckles to himself and then continues to smile while he watches them gun down Werner Herzog's character like he expected this to happen. So number three WTF, the Mandalorian kills Werner Herzog's character. It's almost unceremonious, but everything just kind of erupts into chaos. So it was a nice quick action scene bridging to a much bigger action scene and big WTF ending to the episode. But as all the Imperial reinforcements start rolling in, number two, the scout troopers capture Baby Yoda and seems like they kill Kuil's character and his blurg. But remember, IG-11 is still fully functional and waiting back on the Razor Crest to swoop in and help them out in the finale. In number one, probably one of the best moments of the episode next to Darkseid force choking Baby Yoda, Moff Gideon descends from on high in his regular TIE fighter, revealing himself as the real big bad of the season. So if it wasn't clear, he's been pulling the strings this whole time. He's been the person behind Werner Herzog in all the efforts to find the child. They have a really cool special effects scene of them showing you what it looks like when a regular TIE fighter lands. He's wearing a slightly modified, beefed up version of a TIE pilot's uniform, but the black sort of gives you some Darth Vader vibes because he's wearing a cape, which isn't super common for Imperials. So anytime you see someone dressed in all black armor wearing a black cape, you're meant to think of Darth Vader. And here's a really important thing too. There's a lot of people that thought this person at the end of episode five with the spurs in the cape was Moff Gideon. It's not because listen here when he walks in, his boots don't make any kind of sound. He's not wearing any spurs or anything like that. So it couldn't have been him. We'll have to find out who that is hopefully in the finale. I don't know why they would tease that and then not pay it off in the finale. But he starts evil guy monologuing about the true importance of Baby Yoda. I've already done a couple videos about my theory, what their big plan is. Like I said, creating an army of super clones using his DNA that are force sensitive and also have longer lifespans because he lives so long naturally. Big reminder that episode 8 will be next Friday like normal. This episode just came a couple days early because Rise of Skywalker is hitting theaters this weekend. Congratulations Kylo11849, you're the giveaway winner from my last big Mandalorian video. Please email me on the about page of my channel so I can get your details. Everyone click here for my Mandalorian episode 6 video and click here for my new Baby Yoda video. Thank you so much for watching, everybody stay awesome, I have spoken.